the central bank has always um, been guided in the definition of unification by the IMF position, which is that uh, multiple currency environment is one where the difference between the rates exceeds 5%. Um, and uh, it's always tried to keep the gap between the official rate and um, the interbank rate and even BDC rates to within that range, um, usually about 3%. Uh, what you have today, um, obviously, and what you've had in quite in a number of periods um, since 2015, has been um, that this rule has been um, observed in the breach, uh, with huge gaps between um, the official rate and uh, the NAFEX and also the BDC rates. Um, I, I think what the central bank is trying to do is um, bridge that gap, and I think uh, and, and the moves that have been made in January and in July have brought the um, CBN rate and the uh, NAFEX rates closer. The BDC rate remains an outlier. Um, and, and I think we shouldn't get, uh, it's, it, unfortunately, it's such a small percentage of the market, but it does have um, an impact on speculation, uh, which is why it's important to fund that market. So when you see this huge gap between NAFEX and BDC, it's just a reflection of funding being taken out of the market because of shortage of foreign exchange. And once the central bank has enough money and funds that market, it will probably converge um, to us. So um, I would not be interested in moving the rate towards 470, for example, uh, but would like to see a convergence of uh, CBN and FX, which, which will take care of over 90% of the transactions um, in the market. And there's some small funding um, for the BDC rate to bring it back uh, to that level. I think that is a general direction the central bank is going in. Uh, it's um, what everyone has been um, proposing for the last three, four years. It's what the IMF and the World Bank um, have asked for. Uh, it makes for policy transparency. It makes for clarity of direction. Um, it also reduces the speculative demand uh, for, 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 for Naira as people just continue to anticipate um, a cycle, continuous cycle um, of devaluation. So uh, for me, this is central bank finally basically saying we will do what... Um, the market has been asking for. Okay. When I was in the central bank, and I think that has continued, central bank had a policy of um, uh, basically giving guidance on a range uh, within which the rates would move. And we had um, a soft peg. Um, and frankly, the level is always determined by the levels of demand and supply. And I do have a lot of sympathy for the central bank at this moment. Um, a lot of the shocks you have in a shock that the central bank has no control over. Nobody knows what's going to happen to all price. Nobody knows how much um, the central bank is going to have on in its, in its kitty. It would be a very brave governor of the central bank who would announce a target rate when he doesn't know how much is going to come in and what's going to happen to the oil price tomorrow or the day after. Uh, and the entire world is going through shocks. I think it's extremely important um, that we recognize that, um, that the, um, the, the only clarity that central bank can give at the moment is to say we do plan to um, converge. And that means uh, the official rate is going to be devalued, um, but we're not going to do it um, in, uh, in a rapid and disorderly manner. Now, going back to the question on liquidity, um, it's, a deter it's a function also of the price. So you've got a lot of... Um, um, portfolio investors who would like to um, to take their money out today. You've got, I think, four billion um, on 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 the wait list. Um, the reserves of the country are thirty six billion. The central bank has about twenty eight billion dollars of reserves. So it's clearly not a question of the central bank not having enough money to pay this. But would you just pay off four billion at a go, and at what price? Um, if people want to take their money out at any price, um, they could take a huge devaluation and take a hit. But if they want to preserve the value of their currency, there's some virtue in waiting for an orderly unwi unwinding of these backlogs. Because we must remember that when, all, when, you, when COVID hit, and um, after the Russia-Saudi Saudi fire scope, oil price went down to $10 a barrel. I mean, Ni Ni Nigerian oil, uh, the cost of production is about $22 a barrel. Mm. So basically, reserves disappeared. And there will have to be uh, something will have to give. So um, you can either take a, a huge hit today, um, uh, buy dollars of 500, 600 Naira and, and take a loss or wait um, a few weeks, um, wait for all prices to stabilize and have the central bank um, give you your money um, at, a, um, at a relatively 
um, uh, good rate. So I, I think what the governor is trying to do is accept the reality that the value of the Naira today may probably be um, um, higher, it may be, Naira may be overvalued today somewhat, um, and we need to go through some really effective exchange rate um, devaluation, but um, also do that in a gradual manner so as to minimize the shocks to the economy. Um, the second thing I'd like to say, and maybe I'll have time to talk about this later, is that the central bank is taking too much of a burden for inefficiencies in other areas of government. Okay, so if you go back to 2019, I mean, one of the big issues I had with NMPC um, were basically that um, a lot of um, the way things were being done um, uh, basically deprived the central bank of the dollars uh, that it needs to maintain stability. Now, the NMPC has just published it, uh, its accounts um, for 2018, I think. And um, look, I mean, look at the kinds of things that are happening. Um, NAPIMS, for example, take the general um, administrative costs of NAPIMS after taking out um, subsidy payments, 1.3 trillion naira on revenues of 5 trillion. I mean, that, that is basically over a quarter of the federal government's retained revenue. Okay, these are published figures on, on NMPC guidelines. Take NDPC, uh, which is the uh, um, production arm of NMPC. It has 578 people on the payroll. 554 of them are senior management, but administrative costs are $525 million. We're spending $900,000 per head on administrative costs in, NMP, in MPDC. Now, all of that money properly managed and then when you add the subsidy that has been removed now um, in 2018, the subsidy uh, according to Napping was over 890 billion. That's about $12 per Nigerian. You know, so um, the fact that we've now gone out of subsidies, uh, we increase in fact, you know, uh, you've got to look at this um, exchange rate policy with the context of a number of reforms that are happening, uh, which should make things better if pursued to the logical conclusion. But beyond removing subsidies, beyond increasing VAT, we also need to look at the cost structure of the major foreign exchange guzzler, which is NMPC, and make sure that uh, we reduce those costs and we get more money coming to the central bank. That will make the job of the governor easier. But I, I do feel, I, I am sympathetic to him. He's basically juggling too many balls and everybody expects him to be the Minister of Power, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Industry, and everybody, I mean, one of the questions is, what, how, how will this convergence affect production? I mean, this is the central bank of Nigeria. He's not the minister of trade and industry, for God's sake. But everybody expects the central bank to fix all the economic problems of the country. And this is a problem. And look, look, I'm not speaking for the central bank since I, I, I'm not in there. I don't know exactly. I don't have all the, all the information there. But I, I think we need to look at a number of things. Uh, first of all, we have been with this webinar in the middle of an economic crisis. And you have competing um, demands, all of them urgent. Okay, you've got portfolio investors who want to take their money out. You've got people who want to um, buy Forex before you have a devaluation, um, uh, manufacturers, you've got people trying to avoid inflation and so on. Um, and we need to have a certain perspective to this. The central bank has to think with a clear head. Okay, so um, all price is not going to remain at $10 or $20 or $30. Um, the central bank has to think maybe look over the long term, what, what, what will the all price be? It, it's probably going to come back up anyway with all the um, arrangements that OPEC is making for the OPEC quota, quota cut um, with the when the economy is open. I mean, right now, look, airlines are not flying. Uh, the airlines are not going to remain on ground forever. So the central bank has to avoid going into a panic, okay, and, and basically wait and hope that all price will go up. Uh, the, other, the other measures being put in place, the removal of subsidy and so on, these would now feed into higher reserves and that would enable the central bank uh, basically to um, have an ordered um, devaluation. I think it's extremely important to remember that, 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 that um, the central bank is not looking at today, it's also looking at the long and medium term. The second thing is, um, I think Temi has made the point, um, and Kim has made the point, um, the argument for unification is there. Um, the central bank's ca um, cash flows, for example, if you look at um, cash outflows in 2019, um, in wholesale and retail market was about $61 billion. Now, if that was at um, 360, 365, 360, even if you had a, a difference of only 20 Naira, which is the official rate, that is 1.2 trillion Naira in arbitrage. I mean, the argument is clear. I mean, if you have 1.2 trillion Naira in arbitrage, 
people will take advantage of that arbitrage opportunity. You're going to have people who are going to take advantage of the official market to turn around and sell dollars at a higher rate, okay? And that basically hurts the economy because that is money that should go into importation of raw materials and real production, basically going into speculation because you make so much money by simply buying dollars and selling dollars. The central bank recognizes that and unification basically closes off some of these arbitrage opportunities. From a fiscal perspective, by devaluing the currency, um, you get more naira and you get more naira into the books of the federal government and the state governments, revenue allocation. And that reduces the uh, debt overhang of the states and the fiscal burden, which we're facing now with so much of the revenues being spent basically on, on debt service. So the arguments for unification are, are there. I don't think there's any, um, any, any question about that. But you also have to look at things that, um, I, I mean, when we have our views about demand management, but I don't know how many people realize that in 2019, um, we were spending about $3 billion per quarter just on travel-related expenses, personal travel, health, and education. That's about $12 billion. <laughs> You've got reserves of $36 billion, and you're spending one-third of that on travel. If you look at um, import of services alone in 2019, the, the, the broader broad services imports, just $10 billion. You know, um, I, I, you, know you can't, um, uh, I, I'm talking about $10 billion per quarter, 10 billion per quarter on, on, on imports of services. So you, you, you do have to ask um, uh, questions about how the structure of the economy, what we spend on education overseas, what, what you spend on um, um, medical, um, what do they call it, um, uh, medical tourism, going to, you know, going to Dubai, going to Egypt for, med for medical services, just traveling abroad, how much we spend it and how much really of our reserves do we need to continue um, running down for people um, who go for things that actually should be best produced locally. And how can we help that by investing in quality education, investing in quality healthcare, you know, um, investing in our tourism to stop people from having to travel to Dubai, you know, uh, travel to other parts of the country. Now, the central bank needs help from other parts of the country. So if we keep talking about foreign exchange policy in a, in a, in a vacuum, in the next two years, we'll be here with the next shock. This convergence and this depreciation of the currency is actually good for the tradable sector. Okay, so you, you, you need to diversify your export base away from crude oil. Uh, we've seen countries um, exporting cocoa, exporting palm oil, exporting tin, exporting gold, do extremely well in this COVID period, while the oil producers have been battered. Okay, now uh, what this um, diverge, what this devolution does is it makes it possible to um, make more money basically exporting these other agricultural products and you begin to have a diversification for export, which Nigeria needs. The second thing is that by making um, the imported goods as um, Fedjo talked about more expensive, it also creates an opportunity for import substitution. And the truth is a lot of those things that um, the central bank doesn't want imported. And I, and, I mean, I, I have my views. I don't necessarily agree that banning them from Forex is the way. I think it's the Ministry of Trade and Investment that needs to have policies around encouraging production of those goods. But these are goods that can be produced in Nigeria. Now, why do we need to import leather products? Why do we need to import shoes and bags when we've got leather? Why do we need to import, um, if I, why do we need to import petroleum products? Why can't we invest in our refineries? Why can't we push through um, um, the um, turnaround maintenance of our four refineries and make sure that Aliko Dangote continues to um, fast track his petrochemicals industry. Why do we need to import food? Why is Nigeria importing rice? Why are we importing maize? Why are we importing corn? We do not need to spend billions and billions of dollars on these things. Now I've heard the word socialist. Um, I'm not sure the, it's so much socialism. The reality is we need to move away from being an import dependent rentier state to a developmental state. And the only way that can happen is to start uh, encouraging domestic production and have a structural transformation of the economy. Now, it, go it takes much more than a devaluation of the foreign exchange. You need industrial policy. You need a set of um, incentives and tariffs and subsidies uh, for, for the real economy. You need to take away all the opportunities for rent-seeking um, and subsidies, petroleum, um, power. So you need to fix power. 
uh, but I think um, this uh, the central bank is doing what it can under these circumstances. I just don't want us to have too much of a hope over the overall economic outcomes of what the CBN is doing without movement um, on the side of government, on the side of the other arms of government who are critical for economic development. The central bank can only do so much, you know, um, and, and there's, a, there's a limit. Um, well, let me take a step back, and I think um, Chemi will, um, I'm sure he'll, he'll agree with me. Going back to 2015, 2016, I was extremely critical of the multiple exchange rate position of the central bank. I was critical of um, fiscalization of fiscal de of government deficits. Um, in fact, um, I suppose 80% of the problems I've had with the government have had to do with my being critical. Uh, of, um, of of the policy has been running. So I'm in a strange position today where I am actually defending and um, um, endorsing what's happening precisely because this is what we have been saying should happen, okay? Um, we cannot continue always um, just, uh, I mean, we don't criticize for the sake of criticism. So the government has said, we no longer pay fuel subsidies. Um, that's one, one, one thing done. We're going to look at VAT. That's one thing done. We're going to look at, look at um, um, electricity tariffs. That's one thing done. We're moving to unified exchange rates. So it's a whole series of things happening that are moving the economy in the right direction. Now, secondly, we also need to look at the numbers. Okay. So if you take the current account balance and trade account balance, yes, they've got they're in deficit. But look at where it was at Q4. 2019 and Q1 20, uh, 2020, and you find that uh, the deficit is actually reducing. Okay, so um, it's important to say we are in a bad place, but um, as far as Forex is concerned, the central bank probably has a sense that if we can continue in this direction, uh, we will uh, be um, like, we'll be moving from both directions. So, yes, you're devaluing, but you're also able to increase the funding of the market. Okay, and that reduces the amount by which the scenario will fall. To avoid uh, what Federal was saying about um, the very high rates of inflation and the adverse um, consequences of a massive um, devaluation of the currency or even fluctuation as, as prices go, um, go, up, go up and down. So look at the current account balance, look at the trade balance, and you find that Q, Q1 2021 uh, is better than uh, Q4 uh, 2020. And look at what OPEC is doing. Okay, look at what the other domestic policy and you, and you think that there's, um, um, uh, there's progress. Now, um, what should the central bank do? I think it's um, like all of us is to look back over the last three, four years and say, where did, where did I go wrong? Okay, um, there, there are certainly decisions that would have been taken by both Ministry of Finance and Central Bank in 2015 and 2016 that would have placed us in a better position today than we are. Um, if you look at, and I'm sure you when you consider the, what, what you call the pre-existing conditions. Um, in 2015, when the crisis hit, 2014, the economy was growing about 6%. But when this crisis hit, we're growing at 2%. Okay, we haven't done enough on the power sector. We haven't done enough. We didn't move out of subsidies quickly enough. Uh, we didn't reduce government overheads quickly enough. We didn't um, start uh, introducing transparency in NMPC quickly enough. Um, it's time to just fast track all of those things take advantage of the learning points of the crisis and lay the foundation for long-term um, structural adjustment and, uh, and development. So I think just being honest and saying we may have made some bad calls in the past, okay, now we forced to make the right calls, let us continue in this direction. That's what I would expect um, the central bank and the Ministry of Finance and everybody to do and then for all of us to encourage them to continue in that direction and also understand the challenges they're facing. Um, I would certainly discourage the central bank from even trying um, to just get an appreciation of the currency. Um, even um, maintaining the fixed nominal rate in the face of rising inflation has, has um, stopped us from having a real effective exchange rate uh, de depreciation, which we need in order to be competitive. So um, the idea that the central bank should be interested in uh, getting back to 360, um, it's, it's not, I mean, if, we're, if we've gone beyond that, we've gone beyond that. Um, if we're able to bring down inflation, if we're able to have structural changes, then that's fine. But with the structure of the economy as it is, the obsession with a strong nominal value of the currency hurts the real economy. And this is really what, what we need to get. I mean, there's always a trade-off. 
you can protect the portfolio investors and give them the dollars they want at, at a fixed exchange rate. But what is the cost? What is the cost to reserves? What is the cost to inflation? What is the cost of the amount of currency that's actually going into real production? So um, these economic trade-offs are there. And I think um, having a weaker currency in order to trade off for economic growth is something the central bank should, uh, should go for. I, I should say that the most successful governor of the central bank on exchange rate was Governor Saluda. I mean, all price went up to over $140 a barrel. And Soludo was able to have a real effective exchange rate devaluation. I don't know any central bank governor uh, who has done that. I certainly did not achieve that much as I tried. Um, and, and I think that we, uh, that is the mindset we need to keep. We need to keep aiming for what the central bank did at that time, which was why when the 2008 financial crisis hit and I became governor of central bank, we had the buffers um, against which we could carry out the reforms we did. And if we had that kind of crisis today, the current central bank governor will not have uh, uh, those buffers. And I think it's important uh, not to make the mistake of depleting reserves in order to protect the currency, because you have to think of the next crisis, the next central bank governor, and the long-term long -term future of the economy.